All right, well, good morning, church. All right. Hey, we're, some of us are awake this morning. Now the other half, I don't know about. Let's try it one more time. So good morning, church. All right. So thank you for that. Uh, my name's Jeff, and as always, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here just to play through these songs and to sing through um, these hymns, of the, the great hymns of the church. And uh, it's my prayer today that you will join with us in that as we do what we call congregational worship. So uh, if you will, let's stand together, and we're going to ask the Lord to come be a part of what we're doing here today, because what we don't want to do is we, we don't want to just be up here just making noise for no reason. You know, we love the Lord, and he's been good to us. And we need to return some of that praise to him. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So what we want to do this morning is we're going to lift up the name of Jesus in song. And the reason we do that is in preparation for the spoken word. We want the Holy Spirit to come and inhabit the praises of his people. You know, and maybe today you've got some decisions to make in your life. Maybe today is the day of salvation for you. Maybe today is the day of reconciliation between you and another brother or you and another sister. And by the Holy Spirit coming and inhabiting our praises, going to soften our hearts to do those things that we know that we need to do today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for loving us, for taking care of us, and thank you for this place that we have to come and to worship you, God. So today, as we lift up the holy name of Jesus, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come and sweep across this room. I pray your blessings over every note that's played, and every word that's spoken, and every praise that's sung today, God pray that it would not return to you void, that it would be something sweet to you. As we sing about how good you are, how gracious you are, and how that you conquered death, and you paid the penalty for sin that we could not pay on our own. So thank you for that today, God. I pray your blessings over Brother Ryan as he brings the message today. I pray that you would just speak through him and give him exactly what we need to hear. And then we take those things and apply them to our lives. So today, God, remove the obstacles that are in our way. If there are things that we've built up in our life that would come between you and us, I pray that we remove those things and lay them at the foot of the cross this morning. And all those things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to start off this morning with a great song called Good and Gracious King. If you know this, sing it with us, please. the throne of glory nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious Good and 
and gracious King All the grace that you would see me As your child and as your friend Safe, secure in you forever. I pour out my praise again. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice to the King. King, we lift you up this morning. We also know that you have defeated death and hell. Amen. i 
Until the Son of Man began to wait, and the tomb became an empty grave. Oh, the tomb became an empty grave. It was the dead. Amen. Glory to his name. Glad to have you here at First Baptist. Everybody doing okay today? Amen. Well, praise God. It's great to have you. I hope so far that uh, the Lord has been blessed by your singing and praise. He is certainly worthy of it. If you are a guest here with us, I want to say thank you so much for visiting us. You are an answer to our prayers. You might have noticed in front of you that there is a card here. If you don't mind to scan that top one, it'll take you to a connection card. That just helps us to get to know you as you get to know us as well. And so I'd appreciate if you did that. If you don't want to do it this way, digitally, we have some physical cards that are out and about in the pews, or you can stop by the welcome desk and introduce yourself that way. We'd be grateful for that. For our members, thank you so much for everything that you are doing and your prayers and inviting your friends and neighbors to worship with us. God is at work in changing people's lives, and you're a part of that. And So I want to th say thank you so much for doing those things. Let's gather together and take this time now and pray. And as we pray, I just ask that you would just give your heart over to Jesus and just take this time to worship him for who he is. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus, knowing that you are King of kings and you have put the death to death. Because of you, we no longer have to fear death, no longer have to fear the things that we deserve. But your grace has intervened in a powerful way and given us life. And because of that, our voices are lifted to you. You are worthy of our praise and worthy of living our lives for. 
And I pray today that you would just work amongst us in a powerful way. God, if there's some people here that don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray today they would believe on the name of Jesus and repent of their sins and be saved. But I know that there are other people who are struggling with a number of different things. And I pray that they find that you are a friend that sticks closer than a brother. God, we're here today for you to worship and exalt you above all else. And we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with this church to sing this great hymn of the church with us today? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace.
great singing this morning. Amen. We want to declare that, that we're very thankful for his grace, and we're also going to declare how great the Lord is this morning. Amen.
and that's what we're doing this morning. We're pouring out our praise to you, God. We are worthy of all the honor and glory that you receive today. In congregation, you may be seated. Well, amen. If everybody will open their Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. In just a moment, I'm going to read verses 8 through 12. 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 12. And as you're turning there, why did the chicken go to the gym? To work on his pecs. Paul had told Timothy, Paul had told Timothy that we don't need to be chickens, but we need to be strong in the Lord. And so that's what we're reading about as we look at this passage in 2 Timothy 1. Let's start in verse number 8, 2 Timothy 1, 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in sufferings for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Father, we love you today. So, so, so grateful for this word and how it's ministered to my heart this week. And and I just pray, God, that you would press on our minds this concept of being unashamed. Press on our minds what it means to live for you regardless of the consequences. And I pray today that we would be bold to have a no matter what type of obedience in our lives. I pray your anointing would be on me as I proclaim your word today. And I pray the Holy Spirit would have his way with every heart here in this room. We love you and we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So you notice in verse 8, the very first word is the word therefore. And anytime we see a therefore, we need to see why it is therefore. And it references back to the first seven verses of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And in those seven verses, Paul was encouraging Timothy to be courageous. He told him to remember his faith and to rekindle the gifts that God has given him, but also to rely on God's resources. You see, God has given us a, not the spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And so with that... He connects the idea of us being courageous with the idea of us being unashamed. So has there ever been a time in your life when you were ashamed? Can you think back to a time where you were just ashamed about something? Well, what does it mean to be ashamed? It means to experience shame or guilt or disgrace. It means to be embarrassed about something or to be personally humiliated because of something. And when someone is ashamed, they want to hide, they want to disappear, and they want to back down from the situation. It's interesting to me that there are a lot of people who claim the name of Jesus, but yet they're still ashamed to live their lives for Jesus. And the reason why these people who profess to be Christians are ashamed of Jesus is because the gospel, what we believe in, the good news of Jesus Christ, the hope of our eternity, it offends people. And I want to share with you four ways in which the gospel offends people, and these are reasons why modern Christians feel ashamed about the gospel. This comes from Tim Keller. He said, to begin with, the gospel tells us that we are spiritual failures, For all those people who think that they're pretty good people, the gospel says, no, we're actually spiritual failures, and it's only the sick who go to the good physician. Secondly, the gospel tells us that we are wicked. It's not just that we make mistakes here to there, but that we are depraved sinners who have a heart that is deceitfully wicked, and when you tell people that they're sinners, people tend to get offended. 
There is not any good in humanity. And this is a contrast to all of the world religions that start with the concept that man is basically good and you just have to have that goodness come out of him. No, the Bible explains that there's no goodness in us. Thirdly, the gospel tells us that many good people go to hell. That offends people. There can be somebody that is sincere about their religious beliefs, but they can also be sincerely wrong. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. And when you start saying no one, that offends people. Fourthly, the gospel tells us that suffering when we follow Jesus is normal, not the exception. And some people want to live their lives as Christians, but they also want to have a comfortable, easy life. When people hear that message, they're offended by that. And so to be not ashamed of the gospel means that you recognize that there are unpopular characteristics about the gospel, yet you continue to proclaim it and you continue to live it out in your life. We must stop hiding our faith behind a bushel. There are too many Christians that have hidden their faith and they really are ashamed of what God has done in their life. And so Today in the text, what I want to share with you are three reasons why we should be unashamed Christians. Paul was encouraging Timothy that if you're going to make a difference in Ephesus, in that city full of idolatry, that city full of immorality, you have to live a life of courage. You have to live a life where you are unashamed of the gospel. And you might say in your mind, well, that was first century and there was a lot of persecution back then and the church was just starting now and now that we live in 2023, things are a little bit different. We don't have to be that radical. And I want to share with you today that the world needs people who are unashamed to follow Jesus more than ever. If you haven't noticed, I just want you to think back in the last five, ten years, has our moral uh, standing as a society and as a country, has it gone up or has it gone down? What do you think? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Have we been closer to God as a country or are we drifting further away? Right? You know the answer to these questions. And it's my conviction that one of the reasons why there's a decline is because we have too many people who profess the name of Jesus, but yet they are unashamed to stand up for him. And so this first reason to be an unashamed Christian is that the gospel calls for obedience. The gospel calls for obedience. If you believe that you are saved, this is a very simple truth. If you say you are a follower of Jesus, that means you follow Jesus. You obey him. You express your love for him by doing what he says. You notice at the very first part of Verse 12, Paul says, which is why I suffer as I do, but then he says this, but I am not ashamed. That phrase reminds me of Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, the key phrase in verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but then he says, for it is the power of God for salvation. You see, Paul was unashamed of the gospel, not because he was a good speaker, not because he was able to have a lot of fruit in his ministry, and it was not because he was very intellectual. The reason why Paul was not ashamed of the gospel is because Paul knew that the gospel could save the chief of sinners, which he considered himself. And if the gospel could save him, the gospel could save anyone, and so he was unashamed to share that message. And so, to be unashamed means that you have experienced the power of God in your life. And I don't want you to miss this today. If you believe that you were saved, maybe as a child, and it really wasn't that big a deal. You really hadn't done that many things wrong. Probably that's going to result in you living a life where you are ashamed of the gospel because you don't get God's power. 
But when you know that were it not for the grace of God and the power of God, you would not be saved, and he has radically transformed your life, that gives you the courage and strength to live a life that makes a difference, a life that is unashamed. And so today I want to share with you three evidences that you've experienced God's power in your life. To begin with, as we look at the first part of verse 8, we need to share with the lost. This is an evidence that you are unashamed and that you have experienced his power. It's important to remember that Paul wrote this letter from prison. So why was he in prison? He was in prison because he was sharing the gospel with the lost, and people got offended. Paul didn't consider himself a prisoner of Rome or a prisoner of Nero. Paul considered himself a prisoner of the Lord. His will had been incarcerated by the Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul, it was about being completely obedient. Daily, there would be a, a funeral and a surrender. God, I want to live today for you through your power. And so every day he would do that regardless of the cost. The word testimony about our Lord in verse 8 speaks of the gospel. Paul had strong conviction that people who do not know Jesus go to hell when they die. And he wanted everybody to know that they could have hope. God saves as we proclaim the good news. And so this is a question every Christian needs to ask themselves, people who profess to know Christ. I know the Bible clearly says that I need to be engaged with sharing the gospel. So the question is this, am I going to take that command seriously in my life, or am I going to try to live my life and try to please God with my life, but at the same time being disobedient to his commands? See, much of watered-down Christianity suggests that obedience is optional. If it makes you uncomfortable, you don't have to do it. If you're afraid people might look at you, you don't have to do it. If you're scared, you don't have to do it. And that's the way that a lot of people think it means to follow Christ. But listen, when Jesus saves you, he turns your life upside down. Well, really, he turns it right side up, doesn't he? For us... To live is Christ, and that means that we live lives that please him. And so let's go ahead and survey our hearts today. Are we ashamed? Here are three little tests. Number one, are you silent when you need to speak? Are you silent when you need to speak? That's a, if you say, yes, I'm silent all the time, that's an indication that you have shame carrying the name of Christ. Secondly, to be ashamed means you distance yourself from people who are standing up for their faith. Oh, that person's radical. I'm not going to, I don't want to be associated with that kind of person. See, Paul said, don't be ashamed of me. I'm the prisoner of the Lord. And so he was serving Jesus and telling Timothy, not just be, not be ashamed of the gospel, but also not to be ashamed of him. Thirdly, to be ashamed means this, that you are more concerned about your pleasure, your comfort, and your reputation than God's call on your life. So do that survey and be honest about it. Are you ashamed to call yourself a Christian? Paul told Timothy, don't be ashamed, obey by sharing with the lost. But it doesn't stop there. As if that wasn't heavy enough, he goes into something even heavier. Not only do we share with the lost, but we are obedient to the Lord by suffering by his power. I don't get a lot of people standing up and saying, amen, preach that. But that's what the Bible teaches. Here in verse 8, verse, uh, the third part of verse 8, it says there, Nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. As I've mentioned, the gospel is offensive, and both Jesus and the Apostle Paul told us that we should expect opposition. In John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said these words, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me, before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my word, they will also keep you. So Jesus says here, you say you're a Christian, a little Christ, a follower of Jesus, 
they're going to do the same things to you that they did to me. And they put Jesus on the cross. The Apostle Paul told Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might be, not could be, but will be persecuted. And so when we look at the Apostle Paul's life, what you see is him not living this prosperity gospel where it's health and wealth and, and everybody's happy and everybody's comfortable. Read your Bible and you see Paul was constantly persecuted everywhere that he went for the sake of the gospel. He constantly suffered. There were times he was whipped. There was times where he was, he was stoned. There were times he was left for dead. There were times he was put in jail. He had chains on him. And he did it for the sake of the gospel. It's not really that prosperity gospel that a lot of people are preaching today, is it? Paul had a no matter what type of obedience. Now listen, it might not be death for you. It might not be physical suffering for you. But the Bible promises that if you are serious about your Christian life, you will experience persecution. It might be a loss of friends, loss of a job promotion or the job itself. It might be that you're mocked or shunned. It might be something else, but all believers will be persecuted. I want you to hear me very clearly. God does not think of it as his job to protect you from everything bad that can happen in this world. In fact, it could be God's plan for you to go through the hard times. Do you understand that? Some of you are looking at me like, I haven't heard a message like, this is what the Bible tells us, right? So, we shouldn't seek suffering. That's not what the goal is here. But at the same time, we don't need to be surprised when suffering comes as we start to follow Jesus. And here's what happens. Our sufferings can have eternal impact for Jesus if they're hand handled appropriately. So let me ask you this. We're talking about suffering, and maybe you're thinking in your own mind, who would I suffer for? Is there somebody that ha you have in your life that you would suffer for? Maybe you, the first thought is your family your children or your spouse or your parents or maybe a dear friend. You say, I would be willing to suffer for that person. Maybe that's the reason why. And so I ask you a follow-up question. Why would you suffer for that purpose, for that person? And you'd say, well, because I love them. And I want you to see what's happening here. Paul suffered for Jesus because he loved him. Do you see that? If you obey Jesus, you're willing to follow him regardless of the consequence. And we don't have to be afraid of that consequence because it is all wrapped within God's plan for our lives in the advancement of the gospel. So my first thought is, as I'm writing this, is that I'm not strong enough for this. You know, I, you, you read about these guys that take 39 whips. I mean, I got maybe one whip and I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I, mean, I, I just can't handle it, right? But I think that's the point. You see, in our lives, we are prone to an everything but mentality when it comes to relying on God's strength. But that's why, as I said here in this point, that we suffer for the gospel by the power of God. It's not about our strength and how much we can endure, but God gives us that strength to endure whatever he would have us to endure for the sake of the gospel. And so Paul told Timothy to share in the suffering by the power of God. The very same power that raised Jesus from the dead and the very same power that rescued you from the, the hell that you deserve is the same power that God can give you to endure hardships. And Paul said that he boasts in his weaknesses that the power of Christ might rest on him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And so we're looking at this call of obedience, and, and just, just think about these things. We're going to see how it's going to impact things in a minute. Sharing with the lost, suffering by God's power. But thirdly, this doesn't get any better for some of you, we need to separate from the world. You notice here in verse eight, at verse 9, rather, he says he saved us and he called us to a holy calling. This is the call of a Christian. It's a call of obedience that we live holy lives. We live pure and we live separate from the world. 
This means that when we sin, and we will sin, that we confess it. We don't allow unconfessed sin to linger in our hearts, that our hearts are hardened so that we begin to have our consciences numb where it doesn't bother us anymore if we're out of the will of God. That happens all the time for people who profess to know Jesus. We're not perfect, but is there progress in your life? Are you seeking to know Jesus more and more? That's what it means to be obedient. That's what it means to be a Christian. So here's what it's about. We are separate from the world in order to serve Jesus. That's why we're separate from the world. You see this in verse 11. Paul says, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. That's how God used Paul. That's not what your calling is or my calling is, but that's how God used Paul. God will separate us from the world in order for us to serve him for his glory. So many people try to do things to prolong their lives. They do whatever it takes that they might live longer and live longer and live longer. Listen to me. Eventually, there's going to be a point where we stop living. Death is going to come unless Jesus comes back. Rather than living a life that just constantly pursues, how can I live longer? Why don't we live a life that invests in something that is worthwhile? And so for me, whether I live to be 43 or 93, let it be Jesus, right? That's what it means to be obedient. And so Paul's telling Timothy here, stand up for Jesus, don't be silent, preach the truth, and be faithful to me who has been preaching the truth. It might cause you harm, it might even cost you your life, but be courageous and do not be ashamed. So by show of hands, who's going to sign up for that? Everybody ready for that? I understand that. We look at this call of obedience and we're just like, wow, that's wow. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. Why is Paul having such strong demands on Timothy's life? Why would Paul go through these great extremes to make sure the gospel is spread? And here is the reason why. For those of you who said, not me, I would never want to sign up for something like that. Here's the reason why Paul said, sign me up, I want to have my name first. Because he knew Jesus was worth it. Okay? He knew Jesus was worth it. And so that's going to lead me into this second point, that not only does the gospel call for obedience, but the gospel changes lives. The gospel really changes lives. You think about Paul with his talents, his intellect, and his charisma. He could have lived a very soft, cushy life. He could have made a fortune. He could have done anything in this world, and he would have been very successful. But then he met Jesus, and everything changed. And at the beginning of verse 12, Paul says these words, which is why I suffer as I do. So in the verses above that, we're going to see the reasons why Paul said it is worth following Jesus. So some of you here today, you were offended by that first point. The gospel calls for obedience. I don't want to share the gospel. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to live a separate life. And here in this second point, Paul's saying why it is worth it. What Paul does here to Timothy, he doesn't go to his feelings and say, oh, you can do it. Just be a good little boy. He goes to truth. He says, let me share you some truth and allow this truth to impact your heart so you see that it is worth it. Number one, the first truth about how the gospel changes lives and encourages us to do whatever it takes is that Christ offers grace. Christ offers grace. Paul knows Jesus is worth it because he himself experienced a life change by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing the beauty of Christ and his salvation convinces our fearful hearts that he is worth it. So, note this. You will become willing to endure suffering when you see what Paul saw. The reason why some of you are offended at that first point is because you don't see Jesus the way Paul saw Jesus. To you, you look at Jesus and say, Eh, he's somebody I can sing about on Sunday morning, but I'm going to live the rest of my life for myself. That's your Jesus. To you, he's someone you can put in a box, put on a shelf, and get out when times get hard. That's your Jesus. 
But Paul said, my Jesus is my everything. You see the difference? When Jesus is your everything, you're willing to go through anything for him. So in verse 9, this incredible verse, again, Paul sees Jesus as majestic and glorious and beautiful. And what he says here in verse 9 is majestic and glorious. He says, he saved us, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. So I want to give you three glorious truths about the salvation that we have in Christ. If you're saved, there's going to be a series of amens that will at least come in your heart, maybe even through your mouth, even in a Baptist church. Amen? (laughs) Number one, salvation is a work of God from start to finish. This is what Paul says here. You notice at the beginning of verse 9, he says there, who saved us. That is, that God saved us. We did not save ourselves. In Philippians 3, Paul lists all of his spiritual resume, talks about all of the good things and all the religious things that he had done, and it was very impressive. And you know what he says? He says, that's dung. It's worthless that I might know Jesus. So I want you to understand today, some of you have impeccable church attendance. Some of you live very moral lives. You have a heritage where your mom and your grandmom and her mom and on and on have always gone to church. I want you to understand this very simple truth. You cannot save yourself by any of that. It only comes by God's grace. But then as we look further, it says that it is in Christ Jesus. In verse 9, it says, which he gave us in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the only way. The reason why Jesus came into this world is so that he could give his life for your sins. Jesus took your place. He died for you. So it is in Christ Jesus. If you're trying to put your salvation in your works, what's going to happen with your sin? Who's taking care of your sin if it's about you? No, it is in Christ Jesus that we're saved and in Christ alone. And then also, as we read here, he says, before the ages began. Now, this is just going to blow your mind here. But before the world began, God had you on his mind. It's amazing. God created you knowing that you would rebel, knowing that Jesus would have to die on the cross for you, and now watch this, and he still loved you. That's amazing. John MacArthur has said these words that God has forgiven us, justified us, and delivered us from sin and Satan, from death and hell, in every sense and in every tense, past, present, and future, God is our Savior. Don't ever think I'm a pretty good person, and God just helped me along the way. No, no, it is only by the grace of God that we can be saved. And so that's the first reason why Paul saw a beautiful Jesus and was willing to suffer for him. Secondly, salvation is impossible by our own works or religious efforts. You notice as it says very clearly there in verse 9, not because of our works, right? We're not saved by what we do. Grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. Don't fall for Satan's lie. I'm pretty good. I deserve it a little bit. No, we don't deserve it at all. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, every believer needs to know this verse. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. We can't save ourselves. It's only by God's grace. That's a reason to stand in all. Thirdly, salvation is for God's purpose. As you see there in verse 9, as we continue here, he says, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. So God saved you for a reason. He saved you from sin, not saved you for you to continue in sin. You've been saved to glorify God, to know him and to make him known to advance his gospel. You become a part of the body of Christ to serve him, to sing praises to him, to support those things that glorify him. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. So, I didn't hear a lot of amens. I'm supposing that they're coming. So, we're moving on to the next point here. Christ offers grace, but secondly, Christ destroys death. Christ destroys death. And these are ways that Jesus in the gospel changes lives. He offers us grace, but then he destroys death. If you look in verse 10, he says, in which now has been manifested through the appearing of Jesus, and look what he did, who abolished death. That word abolished, it means to annul or to make inactive. 
It's not that death no longer exists. But for believers, death is no longer a threat, no longer an enemy, no longer the end. Jesus overthrew death by his resurrection. And as a believer, I do not need to fear death because the resurrected king has resurrected me. I'm alive because of Jesus Christ. And so this means that we might die physically, but those who are in Christ Jesus will never die ultimately. For Christians, death is simply an entryway into eternal life with Christ. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's better to be with Jesus. So why not give all you have while you're here on earth? Because it's better there. Do you believe what the Bible says? Christ destroys death. Thirdly here, as we're talking about these these, uh, motivations and changing life, why Paul thought it was worth it is that Christ gives life. He offers grace, destroys death, and he gives life. As you see there in verse number uh, 10, it says there that he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light Through the gospel. You see, when Jesus made known the truth about eternal life, Christ shone his light on death and the grave. Listen to this. And what we deserve no longer has any power over us. We deserve death, hell, and the grave, and not any of that holds any power over us because of the resurrection of Christ. We no longer need to fear. We have true life in this world, and in the world to come, we have life immortal. We will forever live with Jesus, never fearing death ever. So we can be unashamed. We've seen so far that we can be unashamed because of the gospel's call of obedience and the gospel, how it changes life. But this third point is so key. If your neighbor is asleep, shake them and say, you need to wake up for this, brother. The third point is this, that the gospel cancels doubts. The gospel cancels doubts. And so there might be some of you here today that says, that sounds good, preacher. I just don't know about it. I know what that neighbor is going to think. I know what my boss is going to think. I know what my husband's going to think. And you have all of these fears built up in your head. And again, Paul said, God hasn't given you the spirit of fear. Satan wants to paralyze you in your fears so that you don't do anything for the gospel. And we got scores and scores and scores of Christians living like that. The gospel cancels doubt. So listen carefully on this. In verse 12, it sounds a little familiar to you because there is an old hymn that was based off of this song. I'll, I'll say it. I won't sing it. But it says here in verse 12, But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. That word believed that you see in verse 12 means to trust. It is in the perfect tense, which means that it was a past event that has continuing results in the present. So what Paul's saying is, is that I trusted God for salvation, and daily I'm going to continue to trust God. You see, being saved means it's a continual trust relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no reason to doubt. The God that was strong enough to save us is the same God that we can trust every day, no matter what mess you're being faced with throughout your lives. So there are three things about God to trust that gives us more reasons to live unashamed. And so here are things that are going to erase those doubts. Number one, that we can trust in God's character. Trust in God's character. Notice what he says in verse 12. I know whom I have believed. The word know there, it means to know by experience and with certainty. To know by experience and with certainty. So if somebody came up to Paul and said, hey, Paul, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you in a jail? You, you, you could be living a good life. Why are you suffering all the time? How do you even know that your God is going to fulfill all these promises that he made? And you know what Paul's answer to that is? I know him. I know Jesus. I know whom I have believed. And he is faithful. He is good. He is kind. God never promised that our lives would be easy, but he did promise us that we would never be alone And our God 
never lies. So we can trust in him. And so I'm inviting you today to do something in your mind where you think about, I want to think about all the reasons why I need to not be ashamed to be a Christian, to live the Christian life. And then, and then as you're thinking of all those reasons, I want you to ask this next question, who is, who is God in all those things? Has God been faithful even though all those things are true? That's what Paul says. The reason why I keep on is because I know him. Secondly, not only do we trust in God's character, but we also trust in his power. Verse 12, again, it says, For I know whom I have believed and convinced, I'm persuaded, that he is able. He's able. That word means that he is strong enough. Now, there are some people that we meet that are not able to make the promises that they make. But that's not true with God. He is powerful enough to do what he says. He is omnipotent. If the security of our salvation was left to us, where God saves us, but it's up to us to keep that salvation, I guarantee you, you would mess it up. I would mess it up. But it's not left up to us. God is the one who is able and strong enough. He is the omnipotent one. And so what's impossible with man is possible with God. These are reasons why we have our doubts canceled. God has a great character. He has great power. But thirdly, we can trust in God's promise. And the promise is this, that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. That word guard means to keep. And it's a picture of a soldier outside of a prison watching that prisoner. And so, I don't normally think this way, but if I were to try to break out that prisoner, I would have to take out the guard, right? That's the way it would work. Don't see that happening, but, you know, that's just how it would work. And so, in this picture, what we see here is that God is the guard, and no one's taking him out. No one's stronger than him. No one's more powerful than him. Your salvation, your ministry, all the things that you're doing in the name of Jesus are guarded by the most powerful being in the universe, God himself. And so, in other words, Paul's saying, I'm glad to suffer for his name because I know that God's taken note of what I'm doing and I know that what I've entrusted to him is a good investment. And so that word entrusted there or committed, some translations say, it's the idea of taking a deposit like you would deposit your money at a bank. We are depositing our life and our ministry with Jesus. And God never lets us go, and he never forgets his promise. God has promised us, church, that to live an unashamed life for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is worth it. It is worth it. Paul said these words in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Not worth it. So how good must that glory be? That's what the Bible says. So wrapping this up today, are you ashamed? Are you ashamed? If you want to live a life that is unashamed, these are the three calls that I've asked you to consider today. The gospel calls you to be obedient. And what obedience means is that he's the master, not us. And if he tells us to go, we go, right? He's the one in charge, so we're obedient to him. Secondly, the gospel changes lives. The very fact that you've been saved should put something in the fiber of your being where you want to get that word to everybody you know. Now, some of you have suppressed it. But the Holy Spirit saying, wake up, it's time to live unashamed. Thirdly, you're unashamed, you're going to have, understand that the gospel is going to cancel those doubts. You're going to know that God is powerful enough, that our God has a great character, and our God has a promise that is completely trustworthy. So the call today is to live a life that is unashamed. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 8, verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. At this time, I want to invite our musicians to come forward. Counselors can come over here to this door. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words... 
of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed. Those are powerful words. If you know whom you have believed, you have no reason to be ashamed. You can follow God's call for your life and be obedient to his will. Listen, God works together all things for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And you will not be able to fulfill God's purpose in your life as long as you make excuses about how far you'll go or who you'll talk to. Or I'll do everything but that. When I invite you to surrender, it means you lift up your hands and say, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, I believe that being obedient to you is the path of abundant life. Some of you have bought into the lies that you can get abundant life by following the world, by protecting yourself, by making sure everything is comfortable. Have you not learned that it's empty? Have you not learned that it's not fulfilling? You can follow God's call in your life and be obedient to his will today. And as we've talked about this, I realize that some of you know about Jesus, but you don't know him. You know about him. You might think being a good person and seasoning it with a little church is good enough. It's all that you need. Don't believe in those lies. Do you seek to please Jesus in your life? Has your life experienced any change? Are you plagued by doubts about your eternity? Today you can know Jesus, not just know about him, this Jesus who is big enough and strong enough not only to save you but to keep you safe. It is a glorious Savior that we serve. So my question for you is this, that if you only know about him and don't know him, will you be unashamed to give your life over to Jesus? Jesus has told us very clearly, it's worth it. He has a plan and purpose for your life, but you have to trust him. You have to accept him. You have to surrender. So I'm going to lead us in a sinner's prayer. If you have never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, today's the day that you can do that. And it might be as you look back in your life, you've never fully surrendered. You've never really done what Jesus wanted you to do. Maybe you're just kind of following church crowds, trying to be good, but you don't know what it really means to have a relationship with Christ. If the Holy Spirit is pressing on your heart right now that you are not saved, I want to invite you to pray with me. So let's all bow our heads. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that my sin separates me from you. And I know that you're a holy God that has to punish my sin. I understand that I deserve death for my sin and judgment for my sin. But I'm amazed that you would still love me. Even though I've rebelled against you. And you've loved me so much that you sent Jesus, your son, to die on the cross for my sins and be raised to life. God, I believe that. I believe he took my place. I believe he died for me, and now I believe he's alive and he can save me. So God, I'm asking you to save me through Christ. Give me strength to be able to live for you. I'm turning from my sin and turning to serve you, Jesus. Save me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you as we have this time of response to come down this aisle and share with me what God is doing in your heart so I can give you some more direction. It might be that God is speaking to you in a different way. It might be that you need to come to these altars and pray. Maybe you want to commit yourself to living a life of being unashamed. Maybe there's a burden on your heart. You're going through a lot of difficult things right now, and God wants you to come and lay it down at the altar. Or maybe you have questions about baptism or church membership. As we have this time of response, it's your time to come to Jesus, to obey him, to do whatever he would have you to do. So let's all stand together, and we want to see the Lord do it again. Do a great work amongst us, but it starts with you. By you coming forward, it gives other people courage as well. So I'm going to be here in the front. Counselors are here at the door. Be obedient to the Lord Jesus.
as we sing. promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You You're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faith. Oh, 
Amen. You may be seated. It is a, a tremendous joy in my heart to worship Jesus with you, church, and I'm grateful for you being here today. We are going to take some time and remember what Jesus has done for us in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And so, uh, Brother Robert's here if we need somebody to help him. If you need a communion cup and bread, they look like this. And, um, and so, you can go ahead and start trying to open them if you have them. <laughs> and... Um, it might take a PhD to do that, but that's why we're giving a little extra time. I'm just joking. So you might be new to the church, or maybe you haven't been to a church before, and you might wonder why we're doing this. And the reason is, is because Jesus told us to do it in remembrance of him. And we're to do it until Jesus comes back. And so a lot of what we're doing here is an affirmation of our faith, believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, representing his body that he gave on the cross for us. And then he shed his blood for the covering of our sins, that we might be completely wiped clean. The Bible says in Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, declares the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And without the shedding of blood... There is no remission of sins. And so with that, I'd like to read the scripture from Mark 14, starting in verse 22. Did everybody get one that wants to take in one? The Lord's Supper, we celebrate open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member of this church, but you do need to be a follower of Jesus, a believer in Jesus in order to take it. But recognize also that this is a symbolic thing, and it's something that we need to make sure that our hearts are clean. And so if you have a problem with somebody else and you're angry in your heart, unwilling to forgive them, I encourage you just to put down that cup. We're not going to make a big scene about it, but I want to encourage you to get right with that person before you take of it, okay? So let's read Mark 14, starting at verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. It's important to note as we take of the bread and the blood, the substitutionary atonement element in all this, that Jesus took our place, that he died, he gave his body for us. We deserve what Jesus took. And let that be a time of worship for you. In verse 23, it says he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And all God's people said, amen. Our God is so good. And I know it's important to think about what Jesus has done as we celebrate communion and as you go to church, but let every day in your walk with Jesus be a day where you reflect what he's done for you. I do want to share a few words of announcement with you as we're about to dismiss church. We do have some new members, and I'd like to introduce you to them. And so if Anthony and Rebecca and Aaron and Christian Barnard will stand up, there they are. Wave for us, yeah. They're going to be joining our church uh, from a letter, moving their letter from a sister church. And so if you rejoice in that, would you signify by saying Amen. Amen. Be sure to take time to get to know them. You can't assume everybody knows everybody. It, it's about relationship, talking to them, getting to know them. They're delightful people, and it's been a blessing to get to know them. And I know God has a great purpose in their lives here at this church. I also have some exciting news. Two weeks from today, we're going to have a vote on a high school youth minister. If you remember back on January the 8th, we had Brother Drew Hall come and bring God's word to us. And uh, Brother Drew will be... 
uh, voted on on February the 12th. And so uh, please be sure to pray for Drew and the church as we're moving forward on those issues and we're excited about what God's doing there. Also, make sure you are aware that this Wednesday we are having our potluck first Wednesday meal down in the fellowship hall. Makes me say amen. That starts at 515, and so uh, be sure to bring some good food and and an appetite for that. And then I want to make sure everybody's aware we originally had a scheduled business meeting tonight. We had some sickness in the office and some other things that have caused us to move that business meeting back one week. So it'll be February the 5th at 4 o'clock in the youth room, so please be sure to take note of that. We are still going to have Celebrate Recovery. You see the times there in the worship guide. I encourage you to check it out. God is moving and doing great, great things through that ministry. Does anyone else have a word of announcement? All right. If not, I believe it's time to sing out. God bless you for being here. If you're a guest, introduce yourself to me. I'm so thrilled to have you here today. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon.